Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this week in Tedukum video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with the Ryzen 2000 series. A slew of benchmarks for these new generation processors has leaked out to the internet, so we're going to be going through the performance of those. Then we're going to move over to the i9 mobiles, including the H950 series of CPUs from Intel, and once again, analysing the performance of that. Then we're going to finish the video off with, drum roll please, an update to the AMD security fiasco, because you're going to love this one. But with that said, let's start. I'm sure most of you by now are aware what the Ryzen 2000 series is, but just a quick too long didn't read from previously. It is of course an updated version of the current Zen architecture, so it's going to be on the 400 series motherboards, which have a couple of small updates, including support for higher boost frequencies. We have also a die shrink from 14nm down to 12nm for the CPUs themselves, and with that brings higher clock speeds, plus as well a few architectural tweaks as well. So it's not a true next generation Zen architecture, but it is certainly an improvement over the existing architecture. So what does this mean for performance? Well, Okay, so we're going to start things out with 3D Mark and the Ryzen 7 2700 and 2700X. There are at least nine entries that have so far been found. Unfortunately, most of those entries have now been made private. The other issue with them is that the memory speeds of the benchmarks were conducted at rather low settings. It was running at just 2400 megahertz, which is obviously not ideal. But we do have a couple of interesting takeaways here. The first is that the Ryzen 7 2700X is running at 4.35 gigahertz, but crucially, the non-X is uh, functioning at 3,990 megahertz, so basically 4 gigahertz. The Polish website 2jepc.pl has also managed to snag some of the scores before they were taken to the private room, and the 2700X for physics, and of course this is 3D Mark uh, Firestrike Ultra 1.1, scores 20,909, this is compared to a similarly equipped 1800X, which runs at 19,051, or the 1700X, which is 70,825. So if you were to compare it against the 1700X, you're looking at just under a 20% improvement in performance, which is pretty damn impressive. From the leaks we've heard so far, the 2700X and the 2700, of course, both sport 8 cores, 16 threads, both have a similar cache layout, in fact an identical cache layout, but they do have a couple of crucial differences. The base clock is 500 megahertz slower for the 2700, just running at 3.2 gigahertz, and the turbo clock is running at 4.1 gigahertz compared to 4.35, and another crucial factor is a 40 watt difference in TDP, so 105 versus 65. And of course, there's also a price differential there as well. So you're saving 70 US dollars for the 2700, but it's going to cost you just $300 compared to 369. Also snagged are the first results of the Ryzen 5 2600. This is thanks to Sysoft Sandra. Now, this is very impressive because we, of course, have a small increase in performance over the older generation, but the SKU is pegged to be priced under the $200 mark. And we also have confirmation that it does indeed turbo up to 3.9 gigahertz. I won't read out the results because, quite frankly, they're too numerous and you can see them on screen anyway. But I'm sure you'll agree that it's a nice generational bump from the previous Ryzen architecture. It's not quite a leap by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a nice improvement. And finally, videocards.com have managed to grab the 2600X discovered on Geekbench and compare that against the 2700X in a side-by-side. -side. There are a couple of takeaways here. The first is the single core score is essentially identical. So you're looking at 4736 versus 4781. Of course, the nod going towards neither system really, as they are essentially within the margins of error. And we also have a few other differences as well. For example, memory speeds are, slightly, uh, are different, and of course it's a different motherboard. But even so, the single thread performance for the 2600X it remains pretty impressive. And we also have a multi-core score as well, with the 2600X managing to pip the 8600K to the post, as the 
2600X scores 22,235. And of course, depending upon the system configuration, but generally speaking, you're looking at around the high 21,000s to low 22,000s for the 8600K. Of course, single thread performance here is not comparable. Several retailers also have the Ryzen 2000 series available for pre-order, and according to them, we're going to be seeing these things ship on the 19th of April this year, so 2018. These confirm a couple of things, these listings. The first is the TDP has been confirmed, and the second is that there only appears, once again, to be four distinctive SKUs. Once again, that's the 2700X, the non-X, the 2600X, and the 2600 non-X. The final important piece of news is it also confirms that each of these CPUs are, is going to come with a cooler bundled in with it, which is quite nice to get your system set up. How good that cooler is in allowing you to, for example, overclock, we just don't know yet. So it's possible that it's great for just kind of setting up your system and that's about it. But for serious overclockers, it's probable that you're going to want to go with like a, at least an AIO of some description. Next up, we're going to talk about the i9-50HK. This represents the first i9 CPU that Intel have released for mobile, but along with that, we also have the i7-8750H uh, as well. Now, uh, we have benchmarks released for this processor, so we can start to get an understanding of how this CPU will fall in line against the desktop SKUs and, of course, against cu the current Intel line. Right, onto the first i9 for mobiles. Actually, to be more specific, is also the first 6-core gaming laptop, which is also coming to the market. This is pretty unprecedented. There are several distinctive SKUs in the 6-core lineup. As I mentioned, you've got the 8950HK, the it 8 50H and the bottom of the barrel, the 8750H. So eventually we'll see the introduction of the 8400H and also the 8300H as well, but those don't count because they've got a paltry four cores and therefore only eight threads, and we don't want any of that here. What exactly do you get? Because you'll notice all of these are with the H at the end of them. Well, it's to signify that they are indeed 45 watt parts, but they also will allow overclocking, which is pretty damn spiffy. Okay, but I hear you scream. I can hear you. I can hear you screaming. What about the performance? Well, according to a Chinese website, the i9-8950HK scores in Cinebench R15 a single core score of 204. So to put that into some level of context, that's essentially what you would get from a desktop i7-8700K if it were running on stock. But consider me the puzzled on the i9-8950HK multi-thread performance because it's actually lower than the 8850H or the 8750H. Not quite sure what's going on there, but you can see the results yourself. It appears that we're looking still at the same GTX 1080 running across all of them, but you'll definitely notice this single, sorry, the uh, multi-core performance is lower. So you're looking at 1,083 compared to 1,288 or, tw or 1,270 respectively. Those of you who are paying very close attention to this, you'll also notice that yes, both of the top dogs, the, the uh, i9, sorry, the 89 and the 88s have 6 cores, 12 threads, so what the hell is the difference? Well, essentially it really lies upon the clock speed. The uh, HK runs up to 4800 MHz, that's with boost clock of course, and the 8850H only runs at 4200. There is, however, also a voltage difference here. The i9 runs at 1.37 volts compared to 1.285 volts, so that's quite the difference. Curious to know what the battery life here is going to be like. So, yes, if you were to compare this against, like, an i9 for the HEDT market, in other words, for the desktop, it's certainly not going to set the world alight, but if you were to compare it against, let's say, a mainstream desktop part, it's very impressive to me, and crazy, in fact, that we're at the point where we can actually compete with desktops from a mobile chip which is just consuming 45 watts of energy. This CPU, of course, just talking generally about the 8700K for a moment, is absolutely perfect still for content creation, for streaming, for gaming, for, well, pretty much anything, really. 
And while I'm not really someone who uses a laptop that frequently, I actually find them really frustrating, if I'm honest. My hands are big, so typing on a laptop keyboard, it's pretty much not great, I won't lie. But even so, I, I do feel that these processors are probably some of the more interesting parts that Intel have put out over the last couple of years. That's my personal opinion, of course. Undoubtedly, the big piece of news this week is the AMD security fiasco. I say fiasco because the whole thing was just handled in a very confused manner. But CT Labs have decided to tell us more information and why they decided to do things the way they did. Plus, of course, give further information to confirm that the security exploits do exist. Well, they've somewhat dug themselves into a deeper hole. So you might recall that there are 13 supposed critical security flaws in AMD processors, but there was an awful lot of doubt concerning these claims. One was, are the claims actually genuine? And two, why were they made in such a fashion? Once again, 24 hours is just absolutely ridiculous as time to respond is, and it just seemed like the company popped out of nowhere. CTS Labs has now published a letter from its CTO, Mr. Zilberman, and Zilberman claims that the company started research by looking into various as media devices, uh, the ASM 1042, 1142, and 1143. There's a really interesting article actually with Extreme Tech, I'll link it in the video description, and they actually picked apart Zilberman's rebuttal. Zilberman acknowledges in his letter, and I quote, we have started researching as media chips a year ago. After researching for some time, we found manufacturers' backdoors inside the chips you give you full control over the chips, and then he lists the ones that are affected, including once again the 1042. And we wanted to go public with the findings, but we saw AMD have outsourced the chipset to Asmedia, so we decided to check the state of AMD. We bought a Ryzen computer and whimsically ran our exploit POC, and it just worked out the box. Okay, so that's pretty damning, right? So the problem does lie at the feet of AMD. Oops, they chose a component which has a flaw they have to make uh, obviously fixes yes but it doesn't stop there unfortunately in our assessment he continues these controllers which are commonly found in motherboards made by taiwanese oems have substandard security and no mitigations against exploitation they are plagued with security vulnerabilities in both firmware and hardware allowing attackers to run arbitrary code inside the chip or to reflash the chip with persistent malware extreme tech then made a really good point Unfortunately, they are also found in lots and lots and lots of lots and lots and lots and lots of other Intel motherboards and other components as well. So essentially, back in the early days when USB 3.0 was not handled natively by Intel's chips, as media was the third party provider of choice and the ASM 1142 is still used in Intel motherboards right now. Furthermore, if you were to look at a great deal of USB 3.0 PCI Express cards, they still utilize an as media solution. Dan Guido from Trail of Bits, who just for your FYI, uh, claim that they help secure the world's most targeted organization of products. We combine security research with an attacker mentality to reduce risk and fortify code. And according to Dan, so this amdfloors.com business, CTS Lab asked us to review their research last week and sent us a full technical report with POC exploit code for each of the bugs. And regardless around the hype, the bugs are real and accurately describe the technical report, which is not public. As anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. This has been a bit of an impromptu session with me on camera quite honestly i hadn't really planned it but i just decided well it's been a while since well my mug has appeared on screen so why not really um it's going to be more regular with me on camera uh but it's just a bit manic at the moment to be honest with you um, a lot of you do know this but i am planning to be uh, going on vacation that's going to be at the end of this month i'm going to be in the us once again i'm going to be visiting the state of washington seattle specifically and i'll be there for about two and a half ish weeks a couple of people have already written to me asking if we can do a meetup and that's something i certainly wouldn't mind so if once again you are in that area uh, you can email me, uh, paul at redgamingtech.com, and we can probably arrange something. It won't be anything fancy. I'm not 100% sure what's going on with my schedule yet, to be totally honest with you. 
Um, probably should resolve that at some point. I do know that I'm going to be meeting some friends and other bits and bobs, um, but it's just, it's a bit manic because I'm seeing several friends from the US and so we're trying to figure out schedules. But that's not to say that I can't make time for you. Um, I do want to see the area, quite frankly. I would like to go to some video game stores, retro stores, and just kind of, you know, maybe go to the arcades. I think that's a big thing in the US. I've no idea, to be honest. I'm just guesstimating. So yeah, do let me know. Uh, I'll be releasing some vlogs while I'm over there as well. I'm trying to organize a couple of interviews, but that's a slightly different topic and I'll get to that later. Um, so there will still be content from me and I'm also uh, busy trying to film while I'm gone as well. There's several reviews. Uh, today, just as a slight aside, um, there's a security interview from F-Secure. I finally managed to finish that off. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy that as well. It's a pretty lengthy interview, so make sure you get some popcorn. Anyway, um, yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Do the normal stuff, like, share, subscribe. And I keep being told by many on the internet that you need to click the bell button now for the subscriptions. So if you could do that, I would appreciate it. Anyway, take care. Bye.